In this lesson, we are going to talk about how to properly choose samples so that you can use the results of a survey to say something about your population. So if you're going to try to use a sample to generalize about the entire population, your sample should be something called a simple random sample. which means people are chosen at random and in selecting your sample you didn't inadvertently make it more likely for one group of people to be chosen than the other. And a probability sampling plan is something that you use to decide how you're going to choose your simple random sample. It's just a plan of how you're going to pick your people or your things you're looking at. So to produce a simple random sample, the most basic method is something called the lottery method. And to do that, you need a list of all the units in the population and a list of random numbers. So this most basic method is sometimes called the lottery method. And all of your units of the population are numbered, and then you use these random numbers to randomly pick numbers from that list. So, for example, suppose we actually have a lottery game, and you play it by choosing six whole numbers between 1 and 49. You win the grand prize if all six numbers chosen match the winning number drawn. So we can think of choosing the winning numbers as the same thing as choosing a simple random sample of six two-digit numbers. So first assign each number an ID from 0, 1 to 49, because those are the numbers chosen for our game. And then using a table of random digits, a computer, or a calculator to randomly select six two-digit numbers between 0, 1 and 49. So just so that we're consistent, let's use the same list. So here's a list of random numbers and we're going to look at them two by two and keep the numbers that are between 0, 1, and 49. So our first number we look at, if we look at it in twos, 76 is not, so we just don't use that one. And you move on, the next number 42 is, so 42 will be our first random number. The next two digits make 96, so that's too big. 97, that's too big, but 30, that's okay. 23 is also good. 39 is also good. I need six of these. 51 is just a hair too big, but next we have 26. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, one more. 94, too big. 43 is okay. And so there is our simple random sample we found using a list of numbers. Suppose a radio station has a contest each day for a week in which the DJ randomly selects one birthday, month and day, they don't specify the year, and they announce it on the air. The first person with that birthday who calls the station wins a prize, and a new birthday is selected for each of the seven days, and the station doesn't mind if the same birthday is selected more than once over the course of that contest. So first of all, what is the list of units from which a selection will be made? So assuming that we're talking about leap years, we're going to have to number the birthdays 0, 0, 001 to 366. And if the station did not have access to appropriate software, explain how they can randomly select a birthday each day. So they could, for example, print out a list with these numbers and draw at random after mixing well. So print out these numbers cut into little pieces and randomly draw one after mixing. Not very advanced, but they could do it that way. 
Now, sometimes just choosing a plain, simple, random sample is cumbersome, and it can be... You can also get random samples by choosing things in different ways that are not nearly as difficult to implement, and so we'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. But before we go there, we're going to introduce some different kinds of samples. So something called a stratified random sample. Stratified random sample. You divide the population of units into something called strata, or just subgroups, and then take a random sample from each one. So, for example, suppose we could divide the class into men and women, and then randomly choose A certain number, say 10 from each. So think about that. You have groups. Here's your men group. Here's your women group. And you randomly pick some people from that group. That person, that person, that person. So divide into groups and then do a simple random sample within the groups. Something called cluster sampling. You divide the population into clusters, but rather than sampling in each cluster, you select a random sample of clusters. So, for example, suppose we divide students into three classes. and we randomly select one class to get a survey or something like that. So the idea there is you divide into groups, and usually that division into groups should be somewhat random, and then you choose everybody in a group, and the other group doesn't get selected. something called systematic sampling. It is done by dividing the population list into as many consecutive segments as you need that are equal to your sample size, and then randomly choosing a starting point in the first segment and sampling at that point within each segment. Now that sounds really confusing, but I think you could understand this with an example. This is really commonly applied to um, checking products in like an assembly line. So for example, checking every 100th item in an assembly line. You decide ahead of time that you're going to need to produce so many samples, that's how, that's how the whole many consecutive segments, you want to sample 100 people, or maybe say 200 things, you say that, okay, well, I have to divide however many things I have into 200 pieces, and then you randomly pick a point to start in your first round of stuff, and once you check the 21st coffee cup, after that you're going to check the 121st, 221st coffee cup. And in the end, once you've sampled everything that goes through the assembly line that day, you have the sample size you need. But you do it in a very systematic manner. Okay, something. This is called random digit dialing. So where a computer randomly constructs and dials telephone numbers. That's how you get those political calls that you love so much. Kidding. Random digit dialing. And multi-stage sampling this combined sampling methods or repeats the same method to successively sample smaller and smaller proportions of the populations 
So a class of 200 students is numbered from 1 to 200, and a table of random digits is used to choose 60 of the students from that class. Is the group of students selected a simple random sample, a stratified random sample, a cluster sample, or a systematic sample? So just running through the options, it seems like a simple random sample is probably what this is, but let's just make sure that none of the others apply. So a stratified random sample, where the students divided into groups and then, cho then, gr then chosen from those groups. So no. Were they divided into groups and we just picked one of the groups? No. And it also isn't the case we picked, say, like every tenth student or something like that. So it's not systematic either. So this is a simple random sample. Suppose a state has 10 universities, 25 four-year colleges, and 50 community colleges, each of which offer multiple sections of an introductory statistics class each year. Researchers want to conduct a survey of students taking introductory statistics in the state. Explain a method for collecting each of the following types of samples. So a stratified random sample. So we have to divide these these institutions of higher learning into different, say, groups. And I think a pretty obvious grouping is to group by type of institution it is. So you could have one group that's university, one group that's four-year colleges, and one group that's community colleges. So let's write that down. So use the three types of schools as strata. And then, once you have that done, you're going to create a list of students for each strata. So there'll be a list for university, a list for four-year college, and a list for community college. And the list for the university will have all the students who attend any one of those 10 universities, etc. Same for the four-year and community college. And then you're going to draw a random sample from each of the three lists. And the thing to notice there, so I'm sure you don't note, that you can get students from any institution in your sample. As in, I mean, it's possible that you could have to survey students at all 10 universities, all 25 four-year colleges, and all 50 community colleges, which might just be kind of complicated. So that's one reason that stratified, a stratified sample is not necessarily the best, is because you still have to survey people in all those places. One thing you could do with it at this stage when you select or draw the random sample you could do it in a way that was proportional to the number of students at each of the institutions. So you'd ensure that you'd have samples of sizes that reflected the relative sizes of those different places. You didn't accidentally get people that were only at community colleges or only at four-year institutions. Okay, a cluster sample. Okay, so what we can do for this, we have to divide things into clusters and then choose from choose some random clusters. And I think a really good idea here would be to use the individual schools or classes
as clusters and then select a random sample. of either schools or classes. So you take a list of all of the different classes of statistics that are offered at all these places and number them like, I don't know, one through 300, for example, if there were 300 of them. And then you randomly choose some of those. And you could ensure that you choose some that are university, some that are four-year colleges, and some that are community colleges, but then you have to survey an entire class as opposed to random people that are scattered all over the place. This is probably going to be easier. And a straight-up simple random sample, all you do with that is you get a list of every single student at every single school, and then you randomly sample from that list. So obtain a list of all students at all schools. And then you take a simple random sample from that list. This is going to be probably a lot of work because you could have to ask, give your survey to people that are all over the place in lots of different institutions, and that could be challenging. What also could be a little bit challenging, one reason that even a stratified sample might be better is if you just do a random sample, you might have a disproportionate amount of people at a four-year college or a community college relative to university. So it's just a possibility. Now, lots of things can go wrong in sampling. We're going to discuss them. So the first major problem that can occur is you can do something called use the wrong sampling frame. So remember, the sampling frame is the list of units from which the sample is selected. And using the wrong sampling frame means that you don't select from the people you actually want to generalize about. So a good example would be asking a, say, political question and only asking people who have landlines. So suppose you want to figure out how many people are going to vote for candidate X and you do a random telephone survey and you call people. Well, most random telephone surveys just call landlines. They don't call cell phones. So if you do this and you use only landlines, you're going to tend to get population that's probably older. And that group might have a, a different opinion than the whole population. Not reaching the individual selected might include, just like what we just said, for example, landline calls will reach more elderly people. non-response, volunteer response, and non-participation might include. So non-response obviously is not responding. So that's all this, these are all sort of like the same thing. Non-response, volunteer response, and non-participation all mean the same thing. So this just includes the fact that people tend to not participate in surveys. either telephone or mail-in surveys. And it doesn't matter how good your sample is. If your sample is good, 
But when you try to actually ask people questions, they decline to answer, all of a sudden you have problems. So a sample that consists of individuals who pick themselves, that is called a self-selected sample. And this is a problem because only people in general, the people who tend to respond to these, are usually those with strong opinions. An example of a um, place where you have self-selected samples could be ratemyprofessor.com. Like that's certainly a self-selected sample, and in general, people that go on there tend to either be often be really, really angry, so but also sometimes they say nice things, but that's an example of a self-selected sample. So a convenient sample is constructed using the most convenient group available to decide on the spot who to sample. So a local government wants to determine whether taxpayers support increasing local taxes to provide more public funding to schools. They randomly select 500 school children from a list of all the children enrolled in the local schools, and then they survey the parents of these children about possible tax increases. So what is the population? Who do they want to generalize about? Is it just the parents, or is it all taxpayers? And the kicker is, is they, want, they care about all taxpayers in the area. But what sampling frame did they use? So did they randomly survey all taxpayers? No, they randomly surveyed parents of children in schools. So they surveyed parents of children who attend school. And if there were students in some correspondence program, that could technically possibly include them as well. So explain why the problem called using the wrong sampling frame might lead to a biased estimate of taxpayer support for increasing taxes. And the obvious problem here is by looking at only parents, they leave out all those people who don't have kids, and they might have different opinions. So by looking at only parents, with children in school. Local taxpayers without children. Or not included. It's likely that non-parents may have a different opinion. On this issue than parents. So in each part, indicate whether the sample should be called a self-selected sample or a convenient sample. So in a self-selected sample, people sort of select themselves, and a convenient sample is one that's just convenient for the surveyor to use. So to assess passenger satisfaction, an airline distributes questionnaires to 100 passengers in their frequent flyer lounge. 
and all 100 individuals responded, and 95 respondents said that they had a high degree of satisfaction. Well, people didn't select themselves to be part of the survey, so I think that this probably is pretty safely a convenience sample. And a magazine contains a survey about exercise habits. Readers are asked to mail in their answers and 2,000 decide to do so. But the kicker is, is that the magazine didn't pick who would respond. People chose that they were going to be responding. So this is a self-selected sample. So there are all sorts of great stories about polls going wrong, and here is one. There was an infamous poll done by Literary Digest in 1936. So it was election year, 1936, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the Democrat, was up against Alf Land and the Republican. And Literary Digest had correctly predicted many presidential elections. They surveyed 10 million people, and 2.3 million responded. So let's find the margin of error for that. So 1 over root n will be 1 over root, so 2.3 million is 2, 3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that ends up being approximately 0 0.000659 or 0 0.065 that's quite small. And George Gallup, he just surveyed 50,000 people. Let's find that margin of error. And that comes out to be approximately 0 0.00447 or 0.447%, which is also quite small, but not as small as the literary digest margin of error. But this is an example of the fact that bigger is not always better unless you select carefully. So everybody, probably everybody, knows who won that election because you know this guy was president during World War II and not that guy. So that is the crux of the story. So who won? FDR. And then the question is, well, how could Larry Dye just be wrong with such a big sample and such a small margin of error? And there were a couple problems, or two big problems. Okay, so first of all, problem one is that Literary Digest Um, they took names from magazine subscriptions. Car owners. And telephone directories. And therein lied the problem. It was 1936. Tons of people were poor because it's the middle of the Great Depression and didn't have magazine subscriptions, car owner cars, or have a telephone. So the problem was is this ended up surveying people that were wealthy. And the other problem could have been some kind of non-response bias. Because a lot of people didn't actually respond. However, I do think that the bigger problem was that their sample was not actually random. Their sample ended up disproportionately surveying wealthy people over people who were poor. And even though people didn't have magazine subscriptions, own a car, or have a telephone, they could still vote. 
Now, you have to also be careful how you ask questions because sometimes you can introduce bias. So an example where you might introduce deliberate bias in a question is if you phrase your question in a way that says something like, do you agree that blah, 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 or do you disagree that? You should try to avoid sort of stating agree or disagree in the statement of the question. What do you think about blah? Do you agree or disagree? And then have agree and disagree be the things at the end, but don't state them. And sometimes there's unintentional bias. So, for example, if you ask people what drugs they use, you must specify what you mean as in is it over the counter OTC is it prescription is it illegal So in the 1984 monthly current population survey, which is used to determine government unemployment figures, people were asked that ask people were answering that they were laid off as, as a euf, euphemism for being fired. So if we were asked, were you fired? They would say, no, I was laid off. There was just restructuring or something like that. that that's why I lost my job. So is this an example of a deliberate or unintentional bias? So did the CPS deliberately try to make this happen Probably not, so I think this is an example of unintentional bias. If you were asking people whether or not they voted in the last election, why might they say that they had even though they had not? Oh, this is an example of desire of respondents to please the interviewer. And this is a problem when you ask questions that have sort of social value attached to them that you might not answer truthfully. So what I would say here is that admitting you did not vote may be shameful for some. And people may lie. So additional problems can occur when you do things like ask the uninformed, you ask questions that are unnecessarily complex, or you put questions in a particular order. So for example, for part A, your book has this in it and it's pretty funny. So there's a fictional so people, somebody went out and made up a fictional group and they called them the Wisens. Wiseans. And they went and asked people about this group. They say, what do you think about the Wiseans? And this group was fictional, but they didn't tell people that this was fictional. And the crazy thing is that 30% of people had an opinion So, as if people weren't willing to admit that they didn't know what was going on. So, be a little bit careful of that, unless you end up on one of those like late night TV shows where they ask you a question and your answer ends up being silly. But the reason that the people don't want to admit they don't know something. So, on a survey, people were asked the following two questions. How happy are you with life in general? And then how often do you normally go on a date? So which ordering would you expect to produce answers to the questions that were highly related? And I think if you ask question two first about dating, then people are thinking about dating, and if they have gone on a date, they're happy, and if they haven't, maybe they're kind of sad, and then their general answer to how happy you are with life ends up being affected by their answer to that question. And that definitely happened. So when question number two... 
was asked first. It seemed that question number one was related to it. But vice versa definitely didn't happen. Explain which of the three methods, a door-to-door -door interview, a telephone interview, or a mail survey would be most likely to suffer from each of the following problems. So bias due to desire to please the interviewer. So I think probably in this case, door-to-door -door would be the worst. But maybe also telephone. Volunteer response is another way of saying non-response. So the one that is most likely to be the biggest problem, I think, is the mail survey. Because it's very easy, easily to passively ignore it. But I also think this is a problem with phone surveys as well. I mean, Lord knows, I used to answer those and then they kept calling me and I decided to start hanging up on them. Terrible statistician I am. Um, bias due to perceived lack of confidentiality. Well, I would say that door to door for sure. When you have somebody at your house, you don't wanna tell them something that's gonna make them angry. And maybe telephone as well. But door to door definitely would be worse, I believe. Okay, in this last question, we're going to shift gears and go back to those confidence interval things. So we'll spend a lot more time later in this course talking about a more refined approach for confidence intervals, but we're going to sort of go back to this for a second and talk about how we can use confidence intervals to check and see if two groups have actually have different sort of results about some topic. So for example, this, in this example, we have a survey of faculty at the University of California, and one of the questions asked of them was, do you favor using race, religion, sex, color, I guess, ethnicity, or national origin as a criterion for admission to the University of California? And of the 166 arts and humanities faculty, 66% favored it, but in the engineering, mathematical, and physical science, just 38%. So the question we want to answer is, are these proportions actually different, or is this large discrepancy that we see just something due to chance? And your confidence intervals can help you do that. So first, let's find the conservative margin of error for the arts and humanities faculty, and we're going to use that to find the approximate 95% confidence interval for the percent of them in the population who favor the policy. So 1 over root n, in this case our n is 166, is about equal to 0 0.078 or 7.8%. So your confidence interval is proportion you had found in your sample, which is 66%, plus or minus 7.8%, or the interval 58.2% to 73.8%. So we're 95% confident that we have between 58.2% and 73.8% of the arts and humanities faculty in favor. So let's repeat that analysis for the engineering and sciences faculty. So in that case, one over root n is equal to one over root 229, which is 0 0.066, or about 6.6%. And then the confidence interval we find using the proportion of people we found in our sample who favored that policy, so 38% plus or minus 6.6%, which gives us the interval from 31.4% to 
to 44.6%. All right, so compare the approximate confidence intervals you found in A and B and comment on whether you think faculty members in these disciplines in the population really differed on this question at the time of the poll. So for arts and humanities, the confidence interval was 58.2% to 73.8%. So we're pretty sure the true population proportion lies within that interval. And for engineers and mathematicians, the interval was 31.4% to 44.6%. And we're pretty sure their proportion is within this interval. And notice that there's no overlapping in these intervals. which means it's impossible for the real proportions to be in both at the same time. And that not overlapping suggests that these population proportions are actually different between arts and humanities and engineering faculty. So here's the formal write-up. Since these intervals do not overlap, we can assume that the proportion of faculty who favor this policy is different in these subgroups. If the intervals did overlap, then you just don't know. You, the population proportion might be the same and it might be different, but you just can't definitively say one way or the other. So that's it for chapter five.